Hi, everyone. I'm Bruce Edwards from uh, Michigan Audiology, and I'm going to be joined uh, in a few minutes by Dr. Ali Heckman. Um, and as Paula said, we're going to, to talk to you about uh, ways in which you can protect your hearing. That's going to be a bit preceded by a very brief um, discussion about anatomy and um, associated uh, noise exposure and some of the impacts or effects of that. So welcome and please feel free to use the chat box uh, with questions, all right? Um, these are our goals or topics. We're going to briefly touch on the anatomy and physiology of the auditory system. That's gonna be very brief. Uh, we're gonna talk about music-induced hearing disorders, uh, risk factors for um, music-induced hearing disorders, and importantly, really importantly, how to prevent and uh, those uh, or minimize those risk factors. And then we'll talk also about communication breakdowns and um, music induced hearing disorder prevention considerations in a virtual world. So let's talk briefly about <clears throat> the peripheral um, auditory system, if you will. Um, there, we're classically, we're taught that there are three parts to the listening ear. And in fact, there's a fourth, which you'll see far to the right, and that's our auditory cortex which doesn't get all of the um, attention that we would like it to get, uh, which actually would be a really fascinating um, lecture to give to you. Uh, and you'll understand why in a moment. <clears throat> but what we're talking about is uh, in terms of the three portions of the peripheral auditory system are the outer ear, the pinna, the radar dish that we have, the ear canal that leads then to the middle ear, which is composed of the eardrum, and the three um, bones uh, that move in um, relation to sound striking the eardrum, and then the inner ear or the cochlea, which will get most of our attention today. <clears throat> Looks like my, there we go. Um, so briefly touching on cochlear anatomy and physiology and very, very briefly. Um, as you can see in the top left screen um, is a uh, picture, a microscopic picture of three sets of outer hair cells and one set of inner hair cell, inner hair cells. So that's the typical arrangement in the human ear. Um, the outer hair cells are largely responsible for um, the gain or the amplification of sound and the inner hair cells are largely responsible as sensory mechanisms for sending sound to the auditory cortex. Um, below the picture of the healthy rows of hair cells are, uh, is a very dramatic picture of a damaged set of both outer and to a bit of a lesser degree inner hair cells. Um, if you keep that lower picture in mind in a slide or two that will come back up, we want to relate that to um, the results of hearing testing. All right, um, we refer to the uh, organization of the hair cells as being tonotopically organized uh, from uh, low pitch to high pitch, meaning from the, um, the apex or the top of the coil that you'll see on the right hand side to the base. Uh, tonotopic is simply from the Greek meaning uh, frequency, tano uh, is from the Greek meaning frequency or pitch, and tapos is place. So literally your ear, our ears, each one of them are tonotopically organized for a uh, particular pitch being heard in a particular place. Very interestingly, um, so is the auditory cortex. So when we say that you're, you are wired for sound, we aren't kidding. Um, the effects of um, noise exposure can be um, experienced temporarily or permanently, unfortunately. Temporary threshold shift or TTS um, involves, again, temporary changes to the auditory system following uh, either prolonged or in some people's cases, a single loud noise exposure. And uh, one's susceptibility to temporary threshold shifts varies from person to person. That's really important to keep in mind because we're talking in this lecture and uh, when we refer to um, potentially damaging noise, we're talking generally speaking, but there is a lot of variability from person to person. And I think that's important to keep in mind. Um, some of the symptoms that you would notice if you 
uh, we're unfortunate to uh, experience temporary threshold shift would be a sense of muffled hearing, uh, which I have certainly experienced before after concerts, um, a fullness, uh, a feeling of fullness or sensation of fullness in your ear um, and or tinnitus. You can have one or all three of those following a brief exposure to too much sound. Repeated exposures then um, to significantly loud noise may cause these symptoms to become permanent. And those would result in a permanent threshold shift, meaning a permanent um, hearing loss. Um, those of you who have had a hearing test before may be familiar with the way an audiogram looks. And for those of you who haven't, let me take a moment to briefly explain the audiogram. This is a representation of, of how one hears at threshold meaning um, we present a series of sounds um, or pitches under earphones and the point at which you hear 50% of those, the lowest point at which you hear 50% of those, we mark on the audiogram as your threshold. So moving across the audiogram from left to right, um, your ability to hear low frequencies and then middle frequencies and then high frequencies are represented again from left to right. Uh, from top to bottom, we have very, very soft sound to increasingly loud sound. So um, unfortunately, when those lines start to dip down below about 20, the 20 line on the audiogram um, is when we consider someone to have high frequency or to have hearing loss. In the audiogram on the left and the audiogram on the right, um, you have depicted that somebody who has normal hearing, so the hearing is at above 20 in the low to middle pitches, then it drops off rather dramatically in the high frequencies. Um, the red circles represent threshold hearing for the right ear, the blue X's for the left ear. And if you compare, as we do when we see somebody from year to year, we compare audiograms. And then one of the ways we figure out how someone is hearing um, is to compare those results. So the audiogram on the right would, could represent someone who had some noise exposure. And um, if, you, if you look at where those um, circles or those X's appear on the audiogram, on the right-hand side, they're lower on the audiogram than they are on the left-hand audiogram, which means they've suffered um, a hearing loss after noise exposure. Typically, um, noise exposure um, is represented in the audiogram um, in the higher frequencies. There are a number of um, explanations for that, none of which we'll get into now, except that um, the base of the cochlea appears to be, which is responsive to higher frequency sounds, appears to be more um, exposed to the damaging effects of sudden loud sound. Um, again, reported oral fullness in this patient's case, this patient reported having oral fullness or fullness in the ear increased tinnitus, so they had tinnitus previously, and then muffled hearing. Um, this was after attending a loud concert and they were standing near some loudspeakers. So if you recollect back a bit, we were, I asked you to remember <clears throat> what the, um, uh, what the damaged set of outer hair cells looks like, and this relates to the audiogram. Um, one could uh, imagine the, uh, the, uh, the rows of outer hair, hair cells, in this case, to come from the base of that curly Q or snail shell of the cochlea, and that represents um, hearing in the higher frequencies, and that is demonstrated um, on the audiogram to the left. This is the same audiogram we were just looking at. So again, the point is, um, damage to the outer hair cells and later to the inner hair cells can result in either temporary or unfortunately permanent hearing loss. These are hair cells which do not typically regrow. Um, and so this is something that um, is best avoided so that um, we don't have to worry about trying to manage the hearing loss that particularly in, in, in our case, that particularly musicians might experience. So let's, um, let's kind of drill down a bit to music-induced hearing disorders from the larger category of noise-induced hearing uh, disorders. So this is obviously defined as auditory injury from loud musical exposures, and that uh, can come from any of the genres of music. Uh, it can also come from professional or um, personal noise exposures or professional or recreational, if you will. Um, they, uh, this also can result in hearing loss, um, ringing in the ears or tinnitus, 
hyperacusis, and we'll go into these uh, definitions in just a moment, and then sound distortions. I think particularly um, the latter two, in the case of somebody who has minimal hearing loss, the latter two symptoms, hyperacusis and sound distortion, could be uh, incredibly bothersome to somebody who is uh, building or has established a musical career. <clears throat> they can have detrimental effects uh, to that career uh, and reduce not only one's ability to perform and enjoy music, but even before that to perceive, if you're learning, to perceive music. And I think that would have a, obviously a direct uh, or follow-up impact rather on your performance and your enjoyment. Music-induced, um, again, includes all genres of music. Um, so we won't try and define uh, or drill down too much further than this, uh, with the exception that we do have another table coming up, which some people have asked for, and we thought we would include this in our discussion, such that you can see where different musical instruments top out in terms of their um, ability to be super loud. So the consequences of cochlear injury include tinnitus or ringing in the ear, depicted by the cartoon to the right. And that's defined as the perception of sound when there is no sound um, external to your ear. So this is an internal sound that you perceive. And it can be um, temporary or it can be permanent or chronic. It can also fluctuate and does routinely, it can fluctuate in terms of its perceived loudness. Some people bothered by tinnitus notice negative changes to their quality of life. I think that um, bulleted point might underplay the situation. I think many people have changes to their quality of life when they perceive particularly chronic or permanent tinnitus. And again, that can vary from person to person, and it isn't directly related to the perceived loudness of their tinnitus. Um, that can be addressed with sound therapy and mental health approaches. And very importantly, um, I, I would like the audience to know that Dr. Heckman and another audiologist, Dr. Emily Nairn, have a very, very busy practice in terms of treating patients with tinnitus. Um, the point of that is to say that things can be done to help people who have tinnitus. Um, and it's a multidisciplinary approach, which includes audiologists as well as, if needed, uh, mental health counseling as well for coping strategies. Uh, continuing with the consequences of cochlear injury, hyperacusis with, uh, is a reduction in your tolerance of, of normal everyday sounds. So this can happen in the absence of a considerable amount of hearing loss, and this can be the result of noise exposure. Um, some of this has to do with damage to those outer rows of hair cells, uh, which serve as um, amplifiers or um, controllers of gain uh, of sound that you hear. Um, and it can be described as a painful reaction to sound. And we're not talking about a painful reaction to a very loud sound. For example, it could be uh, an example could be um, a car door closing can be perceived as being super loud when in fact it's average loud, but that's one of the effects of temporary or permanent exposure to loud sound. Um, I think that is something in terms of the dynamics of music, which is direct, directly applicable and important for um, those of us on the call and those who will see this lecture later to keep in mind. Another, I think, really important consequence of cochlear injury is diplocusis. And that's defined as perceiving a single tone or single auditory stimulus as two or more separate sounds. So it makes it difficult to understand or to appreciate rather what you are actually listening to. So that may differ in pitch or um, in time. And you might uh, correlate to that in the uh, visual um, sciences is um, double vision. So you have different um, images being sent to the brain from each eye. In this case, you might have um, the row of inner hair cells, which are largely sensory beings, sending different uh, or uh, impressions of different tones to the brain. Um, and the brain is having a very difficult time to understand what it is that it's hearing. Again, I think both hyperacusis and diplocusis are 
um, would be very scary to um, to experience if if one were a um, developing or a professional musician. And so another good reason to uh, minimize your exposure to loud sound, certainly on a regularly occurring basis. Um, so strictly speaking now, hearing risk factors um, relative to um, overexposure, um, we think of the risk um, to an individual or to a group of people being a combination of the actual sound or sound pressure levels measured, if you will, with either um, a sound level meter um, or a sound meter app that could be on your phone. Um, another important characteristic that has, we have to keep in mind is what is your distance from the sound source? <clears throat> so if you're in sitting um, 25 feet from somebody who is making a lot of sound with their musical instrument compared to somebody who is sitting six feet from that same person making that same sound, your experience is going to be dramatically different if, as, if you're closer than if you're further away. Um, and then the length of time uh, of exposure to that sound is crucially important if the sound is very loud. So in other words, if you are um, in a pro pro sorry, prolonged loud piece of music performing and um, versus being performing in a very short uh, piece of music that is quite loud, the effects or the risk rather to you is quite different when you're in that prolonged exposure state. So the question is what can a student musician and this applies to professional musicians as well, realistically do to prevent, realistically do to prevent music induced hearing disorders. I think the take home message, and this is maybe if you don't remember anything else from our lecture today, um, this might be the take home slide. Uh, be aware of the sound levels that you're sitting in or standing in or facing. Uh, be aware of the music exposure levels. And I don't mean using a sound level meter to know, but what your body is telling you for solo performances and for practice, as well as ensemble performances. Um, really, really importantly, Keep in mind that your recreational sound exposure, so you have uh, your MP3 and you have earbuds uh, pushed quite far into your ear canal to give you that really good bass sound and also to mask out some of the sounds around you. The closer you push that earbud to your eardrum, the greater the sound pressure that you're delivering without changing your volume on that device at all. So being aware of um, sound, potentially damaging sound levels is important. Um, so that includes um, recreational sound exposure, particularly um, utilizing personal listening devices. Um, but it could also um, apply to um, your, uh, your experiences if you're out at a bar or at a club listening to loud sound. Uh, both the, your uh, closeness to the sound source and the length of time that you're there um, can change your risk factor. And so that's something you really need to be aware of, particularly for those of you who are going to make um, musical performance your profession. Um, all sound and music exposures throughout a day um, have a cumulative effect and add to our daily dose, if you will, of sound. This is the graph that I told you we would supply. I won't go through this line by line, but a number of you have asked for this kind of reference um, information uh, that talks about um, ranges or maximum, a uh, maxima of uh, instruments. And so now you have that before you. Again, there's a lot of variability here. Not only depends on what you're playing, the piece of music that you're playing that is, but how you're playing your instrument. And I suppose it varies from musician to musician playing those same instruments and those same pieces of music. Um, distance and envir environment acoustics, distance from the sound source matters, as we've mentioned. Uh, the sound pressure level, or if you will, loudness, decreases with the doubling of distance by about six decibels. And we use these calculations to um, estimate risk um, to people who are exposed to loud sound. 
for some musicians, this may mean that um, this may mean asymmetric sound exposures depending on their body posture and as they hold their instrument, as well as how close they are to others in the ensemble. A great example of that is the violinist. Environmental acoustics simply refers to the uh, room or rooms themselves that you are practicing or performing in. Um, this refers to a room's ability to reflect sound waves. So we think of that um, as either reflectance or reverberation of a room. So a room with high ceilings versus low ceilings, hard floors versus carpet floors, um, hard walls versus walls that might have a covering, uh, particularly um, any surface actually with a hard, any surface that has a hard um, surface to it is going to have much greater reflectance or reverberation and that potentially can be damaging. So think of a, a room where you have practiced before where it might feel warm. Uh, some of those sounds are not going to be reflected as much um, versus um, perhaps larger spaces um, where you're going to have harder surfaces. The, the uh, reverberation or reflectance in those rooms is much greater and that has a, a, an effect on your perception of the loudness of sound. Um, we mentioned before that um, duration of exposure changes greatly. We won't go into great de detail about this slide, but simply know that um, the amount of sound uh, and the permissible noise, uh, exposure time rather, changes depending on very slight changes once you get above a certain level of sound. Again, um, we're not suggesting that you walk around with a sound level meter app on your phone checking this all the time. But again, keeping in mind that it's really important to be aware of sound around you, very much like um, some of your other wellness lectures talk about being aware of what your body is telling you. The ear and the brain can tell you um, and uh, when you've been overexposed and it's really important for you to be aware of those. And you have now some information um, either freshly learned or, or recently shared um, about what some of those symptoms are. Okay, um, so I appreciate um, Dr. Edwards sharing with us some of the foundations when it comes to, um, you know, what we can actively do to be protecting our hearing. And I want to just take that a step further um, and provide some practical examples. Um, first off, of course, by starting with wearing hearing protection. You know, so when we are aware that we are around a hazardous level um, of music exposure, um, wearing hearing protection appropriately and proactively um, can certainly have a positive long-term effect. Um, we also know that if we begin this at an earlier age, so starting, you know, when we're, we're learning about um, our career, so right now, while we're in our collegiate programs, um, that have, that has, it's easier to adopt them now than it is later, um, you know, into our own musical practice and performance. Um, so I want to discuss some of the pros and cons of different options because this is the number one question that I get asked when um, a patient comes to the clinics. They say, okay, I'm a musician. I know I'm around sound that is too loud for me. What do I wear? Um, so here on these pictures, there are a few different options. So we have, you know, the traditional over-the-ear um, headphones, um, like in the picture of my cute little kid. He was, I think, maybe two in that picture. Um, and, you know, people ask me all the time, they're like, oh, he's little. I can't believe he keeps them on. It's because I started early. He doesn't know any different. Um, it doesn't bother him a bit. Um, but I could certainly see where for some performances and practice sessions that that's certainly not realistic in a physical sense. Um, you know, your audience can see that, um, you know, but it is certainly one option. Um, foam rolled earplugs. So that's the little yellow plug there. And those are those little foamy pieces that most people are familiar with. And most people don't really like them um, due to the physical fit of it being uncomfortable, as well as the way that it changes our sound. Um, the way we hear ourselves, the way we hear the music, um, you know, if we are a vocal performer and it, how it 
changes how we view our own, um, just our own vocals. No one likes that and you're not going to wear it. Um, but for certain types of sound exposures um, and performances, it might be perfectly appropriate. I do have a video coming up um, discussing how we place these in our ears because that really is going to be the key. Um, a good physical fit is, is what's gonna work best. So um, good physical fit as well as what are you willing to wear? Um, you know, what is going to be something that you feel comfortable putting on on a routine basis? Some of these other options, um, one, the purple um, earplugs there, those are actually custom made earplugs that I could make here in the clinic. So patients come to me, um, I take a mold of the ear canal and send it to the manufacturer. Um, these in particular are musicians earplugs where they actually have um, music filters in them, um, attenuating at different decibel levels. I have a slide in a little bit that I want to share to talk more about that. Um, on the bottom, so this is not a custom fit piece, um, but sometimes it's a little bit more comfortable than a foam rolled plug. Um, it's called a triple flange, kind of looks like a Christmas tree. It has those three little rings. Um, sometimes you can find those to be filtered as well. I found some different filtered options like that. So again, the, the key takeaway here is what are you willing to wear and is it fitting well? So the acoustics really matter to a musician. Um, this is the number one reason why um, musicians are unwilling to wear earplugs when they're performing um, because they feel like they cannot hear their music well. Um, traditional earplugs such as a foam rolled earplug might attenuate the high frequencies too much and the low frequencies too much in an uneven way. So the more evenly we can bring down that attenuation, the better, um, the, the better um, sound that you will perceive. And you'll still have that nice full sound quality with your music. So as flat as we can get is really the goal here. In this little graph, um, it's showing the different amounts of um, attenuation. So you know whether it's a 9 dB filter, 15 dB filter, or a 30 dB filter. Um, 30 for most um, people is actually going to be too much. Um, you know, we would think, oh, the more attenuation, this, you know, the, the more we can bring down the sound, the better that would be. But really, that's not necessarily the case. We want to bring the sound down to a safe level, um, but to where you can still enjoy the sound of what you're hearing. Um, and so, you know, depending on the instrument, the acoustics of the space, um, who you're performing with, and are, those are all going to be factors in helping make that decision. All right, so I was talking about the physical fit being um, really key here. Um, a poorly fit um, hearing protective device is kind of like um, expired sunscreen. It essentially is going to do absolutely nothing if it's not fitting well in the ear. Um, so on these two side-by-side -side pictures, um, this is actually me wearing um, like a triple flange style of formable plug um, with um, a musician's filter um, inside of it. So in the ear that it's properly inserted, you can no longer see those ridges. It's all the way into the ear canal. Um, and the picture with the poor insertion, you can see that I have one entire um, ridge completely out. Um, I wasn't experiencing um, really any difference in, in the sound around me when I had that on. Um, and when you look at the graph next to it, um, so that shaded line is a poor acoustic seal and the solid line is a good acoustic seal. Um, we can see that it was essentially attenuating hardly nothing um, if it's not fitting well in the ear. Um, so it's really easy to you know, leave a leak um, sometimes at the top of the ear canal when we're placing an earplug. Um, and that's what, you know, provides us with that poor acoustic seal and essentially no benefit from that earplug. So I do want to take a moment and step out of the presentation and share a video of how to properly place earplugs. I know that many of you, um, you know, may be familiar with this practice, but some of you may not be. Um, so I think that it'll be helpful. So just a moment here. 
and How to use formable earplugs. Sounds can be harmful when they're loud and last for a while. The louder the sound, the quicker it can damage your hearing. The good news is, you can use hearing protectors to keep your hearing healthy. These are formable earplugs. Formable earplugs are typically made of soft foam, are disposable, don't cost much, and are available in a variety of stores. For proper use, they will be inserted into the ear one at a time and one per ear. First, be sure your hands are clean. Then, roll the earplug up into a small, thin snake with your fingers. Use gentle pressure to roll the earplug and then gradually increase pressure. You want to avoid making creases, which create tunnels that let in sound. Pull the top of your ear up and back with your opposite hand. This straightens out your ear canal so that the earplug is easier to insert. Continue to roll the earplug and gently slide the earplug into your ear canal. So I know that that sounds kind of odd. If you pull up on your ear as an adult, you can actually feel your canal straightening. Um, so this is a very common practice when you're putting in an earplug or even a hearing aid to straighten out that canal um, so that you can have better insertion. Now, so that it is flush with the opening of your ear. Insertion of the earplug should not hurt. If there is discomfort or pain, stop attempts at insertion. Gently hold the earplug in place with your finger. Count to 20 or 30 while the plug expands. Your voice should sound different to you, possibly louder and or muffled, when the plug makes a good seal. Check the fit to make sure your earplugs are comfortable and properly in when he's discussing how um, your voice may sound louder or muffled, that's called the occlusion effect. Um, and the occlusion effect, um, you know, it is a sign that, okay, we've taken away the external sounds around us and now we're hearing our own sounds louder. We've changed the acoustics um, and therefore our own voice um, may sound kind of funny to us. Um, so for a musician, um, that could obviously, you know, pose a, a different set of problems. Um, so those filtered earplugs can be more beneficial um, to make sure we have less of that occlusion type of feeling. Um, but I still wanted to share the foam rolled earplugs with you um, because it's still a good option for, you know, other types of noise exposure outside of your own musical performance. Inserted. If it starts to expand out of your ear, it probably isn't inserted correctly. If this happens, take the earplug out and try again. Have a buddy look and see if you have inserted the earplug properly. Or use a mirror to check the fit. To remove the earplug, slowly twist or rock it to break the seal with the ear canal, and then pull it out of your ear. The best hearing And we're just going to switch back to the PowerPoint here. All right. Okay, so, you know, we really wanted to make sure that we were recognizing um, how the COVID pandemic has changed our listening habits. Um, so not only, you know, with our own uh, um, studies within the School of Music, um, but also just in general, um, you know, at home where we live, um, in the dorm, um, and where we practice. Um, so right now, you know, so much of our coursework is virtual. I think I heard that 70% of undergrad courses um, have a virtual format right now. Um, so. I picture students with their laptop um, in their apartment, in their dorm, um, you know, living at home, um, wearing headphones. Um, you know, so that is, you know, possibly a change to listening habits in a way. Um, so that's likely increasing the use of personal listening devices, um, whether it be from a phone, tablet, 
um, and use of earbuds and headphones. Um, so, you know, 13% of um, children who have hearing loss um, have hearing loss that's caused from noise exposure, um, ages six to 19. Um, this is rising in college age students due to loud listening exposures from personal listening devices. Um, and really I see right now that being um, something to really pay attention to and be mindful of. Um, also some other things that have just changed the, the way we hear and communicate are face masks and social distance. I did wanna to touch on this because I've had so many patients come in um, to the clinic for testing saying, you know, I've noticed a change in hearing. And I, so the first question I asked is, okay, when did this start? Uh, around March or April. Um, and, you know, now we're standing further away and we're putting something in front of our face. You can hear that when I'm holding this in front of my face, there's an immediate difference in my voice because the sound is either being absorbed by the fabric or reflecting. Um, this particular mask um, has the clear um, cutout here um, so that patients can see my face um, for those visual cues. You know, those are things that we unconsciously rely on in conversation um, when we don't have those visual cues um, to help fill in the gaps of what we may be missing um, in conversation, we feel like we're not hearing as well. Um, this pandemic has been especially hard for my patients who do have hearing loss. Um, we know of three things right now that we can do to um, stop the spread, um, and that is to wear a mask, be socially distant, um, as well as wash our hands. And two of those three have a negative impact for um, everyday communication. Um, so it has become more difficult. Um, and that's just something I wanted to touch on if you feel like, you know what, I have just been struggling. Um, it's possible that that could be one of the reasons involved. So when we're talking about increasing our general awareness of our sound exposures, um, I find that a lot of people don't realize how loud things really are. Um, for example, if you are running the vacuum, that is technically a sound that's too loud. Now for the short duration that you're probably running a vacuum, um, it's probably fine. But if you have a different type of um, lifestyle, like you are, you actually clean houses for a living um, and you're running a vacuum more consistently, I would think that you need to wear hearing protection. Um, same thing with a hair dryer. A hair dryer is actually too loud and you're literally holding it right beside your ear, um, which is fine for the short duration of time that you're drying your hair. However, if you do hair for a living and you are using a blow dryer all day long, that can have a cumulative effect. And all of those soft, you know, what we would consider a smaller sound exposure has that cumulative effect um, throughout um, the day and adding to that daily dose that Dr. Edwards mentioned. Um, I really like sound level meter apps on smartphones to just help increase that awareness. Um, these are usually a free app that you can download on the phone um, and they're actually very accurate. Um, so accurate enough for general awareness um, of the environment. So if you, you know, maybe um, after the COVID pandemic and you finally get to go listen to some live music again, um, and you sit down and you're wondering, you know what, I, I realize I'm, I'm kind of close to the speaker. Um, it does seem really loud. I'm having to raise my voice to have conversation. I'm wondering if it's actually loud enough that I should be wearing hearing protection. Um, this is a great way to check. So that's something I do on a regular basis. Um, and a good rule of thumb without tools like this is if you are raising your voice to be heard, it's probably too loud. Um, so this is, again, a free smartphone app. So just another thing to help increase our awareness and just the general thought of, okay, I'm around something loud. Should I be um, protecting my hearing? Um, for our personal listening devices. So, you know, while um, it's certainly concerning how we are using these so much more right now than we used to, um, you know, and I think that that was probably a regular practice um, with college age students, um, but we can take some proactive ways to help prevent that from being damaging loud to us. Um, so for an iPhone, um, Apple users, you can actually set volume limits within the iOS software. Unfortunately, of course, that depends on what iOS um, software you are on and the model of the phone. 
So you may find this under sounds and haptics, um, sounds or under the music app, but within the settings. So if you go to your little gears, check one of these three and I guarantee you you're gonna find um, a volume limiter. Where we would want to keep that, um, if it is up all, all the way and we are listening at that level, the output of um, headphones that are connected to our phone is actually about 103 decibels, which in the graph that Dr. Edwards showed us earlier is really only safe for about 10 to 15 minutes. Um, so if that's how loud we are listening to our music, we really need to do something about that. Um, so turning it down to a safe 65%, 70% limit. And then, you know, if you are kind of absentmindedly turning it up as you're hearing, it's not, it's not going to get into that damaging range. Um, so I think that this is a, a great proactive way um, to be mindful of our sound exposures. For Android users, again, it's going to um, be different for different operating systems and, and phones. A possible option um, is under sounds and vibrations, um, finding that volume limiter. I struggled more on Android devices, possibly because I have an iPhone, um, but I did find some productive apps that I think could be helpful. I'm gonna come back to this slide. So this is an example of a volume limiting app that you can download um, either in the Apple Store for iPhone or Google Play Store um, for Android. Um, this one in particular is called the Volume Limiter Limit and Lock for Android. Um, I did download this on a couple um, different devices and it does work. Um, so if you're unable to find a volume limiter within the settings of your phone, um, try something like this and see if that helps. Going back to some options within Apple. Um, so for Apple devices within the health app, um, and the health app is the little heart um, symbol there. Um, we, it actually is monitoring the volume levels of our headphones if we enable that. So if we have Bluetooth headphones um, like AirPods or Beats, um, those two are gonna be the most accurate or if we have something plugged in um, or other Bluetooth headphones connected to it, it's going to use the volume that you have set um, on the phone. And it will actually provide tracking graphs over time to give you a better understanding of your listening habits. Um, I think that this is a really great resource to use. Um, if you also have this paired with something called the Noise app on Apple, um, through the Apple Watch, it's gonna monitor your environmental sounds around you as well. That way you have a better picture of your cumulative sounds throughout the day. Um, there are some resources within this app, um, this app discussing noise-induced hearing loss and hearing health as well. We already talked about this. All right. Um, you know, so one effort that we have in this collaboration with um, Michigan Medicine Audiology and the School of Music, Theater, and Dance um, is to provide hearing screenings. Um, you know, a hearing screening is not a full comprehensive exam, so it's not, you know, providing that audiogram graph um, that Dr. Edwards showed us a little bit ago, but it's starting the conversation and, you know, making us reflect, is what I'm listening to too much? Um, and am I starting to see shifts in my hearing? You know, if we are experiencing, um, you know, muffled sounds after sound exposures or increased tinnitus, that's that temporary threshold shift. Um, and we know if we have too many of those or an exposure that's loud enough, we're gonna have a permanent shift in hearing. Um, so some limitations of a general hearing screening. So a hearing screening, we are screening at the um, top range of normal. Um, and so it's just a, a simple pass fail. So we may not be catching some of the actual shifts within the normal range of hearing. So that is one limitation. Most of the time, these are also not occurring in a sound booth, um, but the practice piano room um, where we've completed these in the past is actually, it's really nice. There's the acoustic padding in there. Um, so the acoustics for that space are really good. Um, so while it's not a full comprehensive test, some of the benefits to participating in this is increasing your awareness, um, having the opportunity to talk um, to audiology staff um, about what you may be experiencing and get a general idea, should I take this a step further? 
um, and have a more formal comprehensive evaluation to investigate what my problem may be, whether that's a noticeable change in hearing, tinnitus, um, or some sound perceptions that I'm having with music. All right, and if you know it's recommended that you take the next step um, and have a more formal evaluation, um, there, you know, we're really going to get a nice picture of what your hearing, um, your overall hearing thresholds look like. Um, so, not only is that providing just your hearing thresholds, but also the general health of the outer and middle ear um, and clarity of speech. Um, so this would be recommended if a musician is experiencing some symptoms of music-induced um, hearing disorders, um, as well as any new or changing auditory symptoms. Um, with this information, we can make appropriate referrals, possibly teaming up with otolaryngology um, um, or an ear, nose, and throat doctor. Um, for the medical side of things, I recently had a student who um, is a um, vocal performance major, and she was having symptoms of what we call eustachian tube dysfunction, um, where the tube that connects our throat to our ears was not opening and closing properly to relieve pressure and drain fluid from the middle ear. Um, so while she did not have any permanent changes in her hearing, she had all this sinus congestion. She was generally feeling like junk. She noticed muffled hearing, plug sensation in the ear, increased tinnitus, but most importantly for her, um, a change in her vocal quality because she had, um, you know, this what she could perceive as a nasal um, type of effect to her voice. Um, so we teamed up with otolaryngology um, to get her on the right path there. Um, for, you know, intervention that audiology can provide um, would be making recommendations for what type of hearing protective devices um, or other hearing assistance devices um, you know, could be appropriate for each person. Um, take impressions for those custom um, musician ear molds um, and do fittings for those. Um, we can also create a customized, you know, hearing conservation plan for each particular musician. Because, you know, while we provided a lot of information in a session like this, um, most of the time there are individual questions that come up for each person's, you know, own experience with their music. So to conclude our presentation today, um, we just really want to stress that, you know, we have this um, very, this opportunity to be proactive, to mitigate um, our risk for music-induced hearing disorders um, by being aware of our music exposure levels, um, limiting um, the duration, the time duration of our exposures, um, as well as adjusting, you know, distance and being aware of our physical environment. Um, because we know right now with the COVID pandemic, all of these things may be changing. Um, so, you know, what worked for us before may not be working now. Um, student musicians can also help prevent these problems from developing over time by adopting appropriate use of hearing protection. Um, and if that's anything that, you know, we can provide more information on in the future, we'd love to do that. All right, and we've also shared um, our contact information. I believe Paula said that she would send it out in an email um, follow-up as well. So if anyone has any follow-up questions um, after this presentation, we'd be happy to help.